Hello folks, my name is Dr. Eric Wilson. I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston and the medical director for bariatric surgery for the Memorial Hermann Medical System in Houston, Texas. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about the use of surgical tools for diabetes treatment. It's interesting as I became a surgeon that focused on obesity medicine, obesity treatment with surgery, and ultimately um, focusing on trying to improve diabetes or, or help diabetes with surgery, that I started to realize that uh, general surgeries split into two areas. As I do more elective surgery, I, I realized that there's a difference between acute care surgery and elective surgery, and elective surgery is ultimately more like chronic care surgery. And when you think of chronic care surgery, what you're actually doing is not fixing necessarily something, but managing it. And I've learned through my career that managing diseases, especially chronic diseases, is an important part of our, our practice and is actually quite rewarding. When I got into bariatric surgery, I wanted to do it because of the technical aspects of it. I wanted to fix people. And then I realized that you don't fix obesity um, and you don't necessarily cure um, the disease of weight with surgery, what you do is help people get a tool to help them manage their disease better. And that also applies to diabetes. It applies to a lot of other things that we do surgically, including reflux and even hernias. There are things that we do and we basically take the organ out, like taking out a, a gallbladder or appendix, and, and it still feels like we fixed the patient. But as we've evaluated what we do in our practice, we slowly realize as we manage things such as obesity and diabetes, that we're performing chronic care on the patient and we're gonna to have to continue to follow the patient. So that's really changed the conversation I have with my patients. As opposed to doing an operation and sending them on their way, I now think about, well, I need to continue to see you, I need to continue to follow you. And even if I put a patient in remission from diabetes, it doesn't mean I don't wanna see them um, long term. And surgeons are now starting to think in ways that are not necessarily around just doing an operation and sending a patient on their way, but really following the patient long term and continuing to understand how they're responding to your interventions and what you can do to continue to help them. So it's a different conversation I have with my patients and I, I want to see them forever. Um, and I tell the patients I want to see you once a year for the rest of your life. I want you to see our team and continue to work with our team. And that doesn't mean we don't integrate and work closely with other specialties who, who also take care of patients who have diabetes or obesity. It's important to integrate across all those spectrums, but I don't think surgeons necessarily can do any of these interventions and then just walk away. And I think because of that, we're learning a lot more about the chronic disease of obesity and the chronic disease of diabetes, and it's made us better at managing it, and it's made us more realistic about what we can and can't do. There's been a whole host of articles that have been published around what weight loss surgeries such as gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, duodenal switch, or even lap banding, all of these operations, what can they do to help with diabetes and help with other comorbidities? And uh, there's so many articles that it can quite, actually be quite confusing about what works and what doesn't work. Um, but if you compare the different major bariatric operations, you basically will see in a gradation scale, as you go to the more complex operations, you have more intestinal components to the operations, more things done to both the intestine and the stomach, and that results in a stronger anti-diabetic effect. So if you look at this graph, what you see is something from band to then sleeve, then to gastric bypass, then to duodenal switch. As you go up that scale, the weight loss becomes more dramatic, but also the effects on diabetes become more dramatic. It's easier to achieve better glucose control with stronger interventions. As you also go up that scale, we also achieve stronger nutritional risks, um, as well as stronger weight loss and longer operations that potentially have more operative risk. And we're gonna talk about um, all these operations in, in some detail, but I want you to know that even the most aggressive operations like duodenal switch are quite safe now. We've been doing laparoscopic bariatric surgery for over two decades now. And over those last two decades, um, we have gotten increasing skill set and better instruments and better tools that, us, that allow us to have very low complication rates. And the mortality rate from the average bariatric surgeon surgery is now about one in a thousand. So, it has become a very safe operation to do 
to help people with their weight, but also with their diabetes. As you go to the more aggressive operations, as we'll talk about throughout this discussion, um, you will have a stronger diabetic effect, and I think that's important to understand. The mechanisms of these operations are what's so important. We, we do these operations and then we can learn how they work, and that's what I want to spend a little bit of time on, is actually looking at how these operations do work. And we don't know everything. We've got a long ways to go. Um, there's a lot more things we need to learn, but it's not just about reducing caloric intake. Something like a lap band reduces caloric intake and the diabetic effect is, is in constituency with that. It occurs at the same time. But something like a gastric bypass or a more aggressive operation like a duodenal switch has a very strong anti-diabetic effect with improvement in glucoses almost immediately. About a third of gastric bypass patients are euglycemic before they even achieve any significant weight loss. So there's some effects going on here that have actually been studied for the last several decades, and it's not just through weight loss. Back in 1979, when jejunal ileal bypass was still being done, we started to understand that there was some other mechanism where glucose was being better regulated. And then there was this uh, hormone that was originally called enteroglucagon that um, patients underwent jejunal ileal bypass and then ultimately gastric bypass. They were, it was elevated normally above the normal levels than what you'd see preoperatively. And this continued to be studied. And a lot of uh, um, data came out that showed significant improvement in type 2 diabetes um, in patients that got gastric bypass. And I think gastric, gastric bypass had the most amount of work done around it. And it's a procedure that's still done today. If you look at the accepted operations for weight loss, lap band, sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bypass, and duodenal switch, gastric bypass has been around the longest. Now currently, sleeve gastrectomy is the most popular, but gastric bypass has remained a viable option and continues to be done for almost 50 years now. And the early data implied that uh, the majority of patients who got gastric bypass were cured from diabetes. Now we don't like to use that word cured. We've grown up over time and we've learned that cured is probably not an appropriate word, but remission is a good word. And you can put patients who have type 2 diabetes with severe insulin resistance into remission um, with significant normalizations of hemoglobin A1Cs and off their medications with results that can last for quite a long time, for decades even. So as we've continued to study this, we're starting to think of a new paradigm of what type 2 diabetes really is. Is it a disease of the pancreas? Probably not. It's probably a disease of the gut. It's the gut that has changed, and it's the gut that is um, altered by our new environment that we live in as it relates to food. It's interesting that food has changed very dramatically in the last two, three, four decades probably more dramatically in that it's changed in the previous 30, 40,000 years. The food's become very processed, and the word I like to use is predigested. It's almost that the food, it gets absorbed so rapidly that we're putting on the accelerator in the upper gut, and we're not putting on the brake in the lower gut. And that accelerator pushes us towards insulin resistance, obesity, hyperlipidemia, fatty liver, and this whole concert of what we call the metabolic syndrome, which ultimately leads to us having all types of problems as it relates to cardiovascular disease um, and progression of diabetes where we have organ failure and ultimately we end up losing organs, we go blind, and we progress to where we have some type of major event that ultimately can take our life. And this is all, we believe, a disease of the gut. And this is something that we need to evaluate more closely and continue to study. And surgery is a good mechanism to do that. So I think surgery, in addition to being a great treatment tool, is also going to be a very powerful tool that we can utilize for research to learn how to do better medical therapy and how to control diabetes better. I used that word enteroglucagon earlier. Well, Intraglucagon is now called GLP-1, or glucagon-like peptide-1. And glucagon-like peptide-1 is a hormone that we're making analogs and we're using that for diabetes control. And so we will continue to see what we learn from gastric bypass and other weight loss operations such as sleeve gastrectomy and duodenal switch, and we'll utilize that to hopefully alter our medical therapy. So the gut is basically a neuroendocrine gland. It's probably the most prolific neuroendocrine gland we have in the body. 
and it regulates food intake as well as insulin secretion and improves glucose tolerance and it orchestrates a seamless transition of fuel catabolism um, to storage after meals and as we as we study the gut and we work on the gut we're going to um, be able to control the pathology of the gut such as diabetes more effectively. What are the mechanisms that surgery work through? Well there's a whole bunch of hypotheses but a lot of them are tied to this foregut theory and hindgut theory. There's also the hormone ghrelin. People love to talk about ghrelin. It's a popular hormone because it's the, one of the hormones that we know that's out there that actually causes people to be hungry. And when it's at higher levels, we're more hungry. When it's at lower levels, we're less hungry. And it rises with fasting and is suppressed after a meal. And these operations tend to affect ghrelin to some degree. If you do a sleeve gastrectomy and cut out a portion of the stomach, ghrelin levels drop. If you do a gastric bypass, ghrelin levels drop. The question is, how does this affect diabetes? And I don't think we really know yet, but it is a hormone that certainly is integrated in, in the process of uh, regulation of hunger, satiety, and probably glucose metabolism to some degree. The two most popular are the upper intestinal hypothesis or the foregut hypothesis and the lower intestinal hypothesis or the hindgut hypothesis. Let's talk a little bit about the foregut. Basically, when you put food that's highly processed in the upper gut, like the duodenum or the first part of the small intestine, this causes um, the intestine to rev up. It causes cells to hypertrophy, and it turns on certain signaling mechanisms that makes us more diabetic um, in certain effects. We basically have increased insulin resistance and higher levels of glucose in our bloodstream. This has been done in rats where you bypass a portion of the intestine and you either re reduce the flow around the intestine or you actually completely disrupt the duodenum. And when you disrupt the duodenal flow, what you end up having is better diabetes control. This has been done in humans. Dr. Ricardo Cohen did uh, duodenal jejunal bypasses without messing with the stomach at all. And what he saw was significant improvement of diabetes. So there's something about bypassing the first part of the intestine or the duodenum that has a significant anti-diabetic effect. It's probably taking your foot off the accelerator and down-regulating some of the hormones that are upregulated when food that is very high in sugar and potentially high in fat enter the duodenum at a rapid pace in that pre-digested way. There's data that shows actually the duodenal mucosa is altered by diets that are high in sugar. You see hypertrophy of the mucosa um, and hyperplasia of the villi. So they are more prepared to absorb more things more rapidly. And what happens with that pre-digested food is it absorbs so rapidly in the upper gut that a lot of the signaling mechanisms in the lower gut don't get to fire off as, at, at, at all. And so you turn on that upper gut into a fast mode, which makes more diabetic factors in place, and you turn off some of the anti-diabetic factors that occur in the lower gut. So the lower intestinal hypothesis, or hindgut mechanism, is basically stimulating better insulin sensitivity, better insulin production, and better pancreatic function by food hitting the lower intestine and cells down there stimulating hormones such as GLP-1 and other hormones that improve insulin function and insulin sensitivity. So GLP-1 is a hormone that does a lot of things. It gets stimulated by the lower gut. It reduces appetite. It decreases gastric emptying. It um, improves insulin pr production. It increases beta cell proliferation. It increases insulin secretion, also increases insulin sensitivity, and reduces glucose production by the liver. All of these things are improving factors in a patient that's diabetic. So if you have more GLP-1 circulating, um, you have better control of diabetes. And that's why so many analogs of GLP-1 are now being developed. And bypass operations, such as duodenal switch and gastric bypass, have, have greatly in, enhanced the production of GLP-1, and this has been measured in multiple studies. So as GLP-1 goes up, when you bypass a portion of the intestine, it stimulates better diabetes control. There have been uh, studies that have looked at things like sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bypass, for many, many years and its effect on diabetes. And for the longest time, we didn't really understand how well it worked compared to medical therapy.
But there was a trial called the Stampede trial, which was a very powerful trial, which basically looked at patients who got medical therapy versus sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass, and they've now been followed out for five years. And um, the five-year outcomes are actually quite good. What you see is significant improvement in hemoglobin A1Cs that have sustained to be better than medical therapy for five years. And if you look at the medications used in the patients that had surgery versus the medications that were used for control of diabetes in the patients that got intensive medical therapy, there was a whole lot less patients on insulin and more aggressive medications at the end of five years of, of those that required any medications after surgery. So there was a much higher rate of remission in the patients that got surgery and less aggressive medications. And I think the important thing to think about is we need to get patients off insulin or avoid them getting on insulin as much as possible. And the reason I say that is why it's a great drug at controlling blood sugar, it also is a great drug at promoting weight gain. And in, once you start a patient on insulin, over time what you're going to see usually is the patient continue to gain weight. Now in the Stampede trial, the patients did not gain significant weight overall, but there were substantial weight gain achieved in the patients who had medical weight loss. It just didn't go up overall on average. When you compare that to surgery, um, almost every patient, of course, had significant weight loss. So sleeve gastrectomy and gastric bypass are both powerful anti-diabetic operations. What you see is that with gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy, um, diabetes resolution or remission is very high and sustained for five years. Um, and it might be slightly better for gastric bypass because a portion of the intestine is, is bypassed, but both are very powerful operations in improved diabetes. The data from the Stampede trial actually look quite favorable for both. And we'll continue to see how these patients do as they get further and further out from surgery. When you think of something like a duodenal switch, which basically combines a sleeve gastrectomy and a gastric bypass together, the effect is even more powerful. If you look at the outcomes as it relates to adverse effects, they also followed these patients uh, long-term for any adver adverse effects from the surgery. You actually saw very low complication rates, which gets back to what I said earlier. These operations are very safe with very low mo mortality and very low morbidity, and the patients in the medical therapy had as much or more complications and a higher death rate than those that were treated with surgery. That's been shown in other studies as well. Patients who get surgery, yes, they can have complications from surgery. Um, and yes, those complications can have, have to be managed. But people who don't get surgery and continue to live with the disease of diabetes and it's not as well controlled as those who get surgery can have a whole bunch of complications as well and actually can have the same or higher mortality rates. There was another study that looked at gastric bypass patients 12 years out and evaluated how these patients did in an even longer term follow-up. And what you see is in this study, they compared patients who had surgery versus two sets of medical supervised patients. And what we saw, improvement in weight, improvement in body mass index, improvement in blood pressure, improvement in glucose, improvement in hemoglobin A1C, improvement in LDL cholesterol, improvement in HDL cholesterol and triglycerides, all compared to the non-surgery groups. This is at 12 years. So these are durable effects that occur from surgery and have good control of diabetes. Now, not everyone is completely off all their medications. Um, that is true. But you can manage patients better with these types of operations because their internal mechanisms are better supported with the way their gut's been altered. And that gut alteration allows you to have much better control of their diabetes with fewer medications and hopefully with less insulin. So what other options are out there? Well, there's, there's other operations that are being evaluated and studied um, that I think everyone should know about, and I'll just briefly go over those. There's variations off of the duodenal switch, and the reason the duodenal switch is not as popular as many would think is simply because it has some significant malnutrition risks. There are variations of this such as SADI or SIPS, which is basically a single anastomosis without a RULAM being performed when you do a duodenal switch. And this simpler form of the operation allows for lower nutritional deficits 
and less nutritional risks. And this is being studied and being performed in an increasing number of, of centers around the country. And I think it's important for people to understand that, that we're continuing to evolve our procedures, varying our operations off of sleeve gastrectomy and duodenal switch in order to improve the outcomes, reduce the complications, renew, reduce the nutritional effects, um, but have better diabetes control. There's even a version called interposition surgery where you take the ileum and you transpose it into the upper gut. You can either transpose it past the duodenum or you can transpose it um, above to the upper, upper intestine and the jejunum. And the effects of this have been studied in rats and also in humans and basically have significant improvement in hemoglobin A1C. This is one study that showed a de decrease in hemoglobin A1C from 9 down to 5.8. Um, an overall hemoglobin A1C of less than 7% achieved in 86% of patients. This has been studied a lot outside the United States, in countries like Brazil and India, and has not been studied much in the United States, but we performed a trial in our local center and, and saw good results with diabetes in patients with lower BMIs. And the, the advantage of operations such as this is we're bypassing only a small segment of the bowel by basically transposing it, and very little bowel is bypassed, and that allows to have better nutritional outcomes with less malabsorption and less malnutrition um, with these operations. That being said, these operations still are fairly complicated, and they're not being done in a routine manner, um, but yet they will continue to be studied, and I think we'll learn more about diabetes control with these types of operations as more of them are being done. So we're also learning more as we, as we take patients who've had previous bariatric surgery and we revise them. And I think this is an important area. When we do bariatric surgery, not every patient achieves the effect they want to achieve. There is um, recidivism of weight. There is recidivism of diabetes. Patients' hemoglobin A1Cs can go back up over time. Although it's not extremely common, it does happen and it depends upon what type of operation they had before. So as we revise these patients, we're learning about more pathways that are important as it relates to managing diabetes. And so bariatric surgery, like I said at the beginning, it is a chronic care model. And just because you do one operation doesn't mean that something else doesn't need, be, need to be done down the road. And that's why we need to continue to follow the patients. The intestinal limbs may not be of the appropriate length for that individual patient. And it's always a challenge to try to figure out the appropriate balance of intestinal bypass in order to achieve adequate glucose control. But we have very safe ways of doing this now with laparoscopy. And reoperating on the pa patient with laparoscopy allows us to do this with very low morbidity. And so we will continue to evaluate these patients and figure out if there's other things that we can do in a safe manner to continue to improve their glucose control and their obesity. In addition to all of the procedures that we've, we've talked about, there are patients out there that have diabetes or have obesity, and they don't want the procedures that we are offering. Um, they're either con concerned about the risks of them, they're not fully educated about the pros and cons of them, or um, they, they can't afford the operation. So other procedures are being developed that hopefully will uh, address some of these effects in, in certain diabetic populations, and I'll talk about just a, a couple of them. There's a whole host of endoluminal therapies, including balloons and, and placations of the stomach, and then barrier sleeves and bypasses of the intestine that, are, that are, are being designed and developed to work from an endoluminal standpoint with no incisions at all, with hopes of allowing patients to have access to other options without laparoscopy. These are still in development and a lot of work needs to be done. There are balloons on the market which will affect by reducing your appetite and reducing um, your caloric intake will also improve your diabetes. Um, endoluminal sleeve gastroplasty or ESG is also a procedure that allow by placating the stomach, reduce um, your, your caloric intake and also can improve your diabetes. But the direct hormonal effects of these operations have not yet been completely mimicked by these procedures. One example of an endoluminal procedure that's being studied and worked on are things like barrier liners, where you just deploy a barrier that bypasses the duodenum, so food goes past the duodenum and into the lower intestine, and it takes your foot off the accelerator of allowing food to be digested in the, in the upper intestine or in the duodenum. And these things are being studied uh, quite a bit. Um, nothing's FDA approved now. They've been performed outside the United States 
Um, but this is a mechanism of bypassing a portion of the intestine and it having strong effects on diabetes control. And there actually have been studies that show patients have good diabetes control um, with these types of procedures. Even without dramatic effects on weight, that definitely shows how these operations where you're bypassing a portion of the intestine and pushing food to the lower intestine has these effects to improve diabetes. Another option is something called duodenal mucosal resurfacing. So actually taking that deranged mucosa, the mucosa that's hypertrophy, hypertrophied over time, and actually ablating it. You inject fluid to lift the mucosa off of the duodenum, and then you burn it to ablate it. And a small area of ablation of the duodenum can allow it to recover with more normal um, intestinal tissue and intestinal cells and actually has a strong effect on diabetes and there's studies being done right now to look at just ablating the duodenum and how it affects diabetes and the studies out to a year now and these are studies that are currently being done and these studies have shown significant improvement in hemoglobin A1c, some modest improvement in weight and also improvement in insulin resistance and once again these show that um, Diabetes is not necessarily a disease simply of the pancreas or of fat necessarily, but a complex disease that also involves the intestine. And improving the intestine could improve diabetes. And it shows the powerful hormonal effects that occur in the gut. One of the last slides I wanna, I wanna stress is basically a study was done back in 2003. And what it showed was how patients responded to operations such as gastric bypass, depending upon how long they had their diabetes and how severe it was. And lo and behold, patients who were diabetic more than 10 years had a less effective response to the intervention, to the surgery, than those that had diabetes for a shorter period of time. And those that were on more aggressive medications, such as insulin, for a longer period of time, had a poorer response to the, the surgery than those who were earlier on in the disease. And I think that's more, probably one of the most important messages we've learned about surgery, is that we're gonna have a better effect if we're getting to the patients earlier. So bariatric surgery induces sustained remission of type two diabetes in many, many patients. Even so now that the ADA has now recommended in patients who have a BMI over 35, so they have obesity, but they also have diabetes, surgery such as gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy should be a primary consideration in the treatment armamentarium of those patients. And remission is better and lasts longer in earlier stage disease. And I view chronic insulin therapy as a slow death spiral, a spiral to requiring more insulin, ultimately resulting in you having more fat because you're gaining weight because you're on insulin, and the insulin requirements just continue to go up until you start hitting those, those bad things of happening of where you have organ failure or blindness, and ultimately you die of a, of a significant event. So bariatric surgery is very safe, and it's currently indi indicated in BMIs over 35, but a lot of these operations are going to be looked at more closely in lower BMIs. Um, patients generally can't get bariatric surgery for diabetes unless their BMI is over 35 right now, but pay attention and keep your eyes out because we'll continue to evaluate patients with lower BMIs, um, and hopefully we'll be able to offer some options for patients with lower BMIs that also could help their diabetes substantially. These endoluminal procedures are designed to go at those patients with lower BMIs that also have diabetes, and they're continuing to be developed. And hopefully they'll be valuable for patients who have BMIs greater than 30 or perhaps even a little lower. As they're being developed, hopefully we'll learn more about what we can do in that lower BMI population. And we should consider type 2 diabetes as a progressive disease which needs to be halted or slowed early with good and safe interventions and surgery is our good and safe interventions and we need to get to the patient before they get to insulin. So I'd like to declare a war on insulin. It's good to have good diabetes control, but before the patient ever needs insulin, they need to get good treatment, especially if they're obese. And that includes medical treatment and surgical treatment because once they start on insulin, it's gonna be harder for us to address them, it's gonna be harder for us to put them in remission and keep them in remission. So we need to get on these patients early and evaluate them early and get them treated early.
I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate allowing me to discuss uh, how surgery is, is beneficial in diabetes, and I look forward to further discussions in the future. Thank you.